welcome to a new Harry's Garage video and today's car is the McLaren Artura, a car I was really keen to drive, especially having recently had that Ferrari 296. Very similar makeup between the two cars. They are head to head as far as I'm concerned. If you look at the spec sheet, it's incredibly close. V6 twin turbo hot V, so the turbo's in the middle of the V, 120 degree V6 on this, just like the Ferrari. 2993cc for this one, 2992cc on the Ferrari. Horsepower, um, slightly different, we'll get to actually in a moment, because obviously there's electric motor involved with these cars. Both have the same size battery, but the electric motor, interestingly, is a different size. 95 horsepower rated on this um, McLaren 167 on the Ferrari 296 so quite a difference there and overall the Ferrari more power it has 830 uh, horsepower against 680 horsepower for the McLaren but the McLaren comes back because it's lighter 75 kilo lighter than the Ferrari with its carbon tub and sort of tech that is very interesting and driver focus anyway Enough of the tech. Let's go have a closer look, see what this car's all about. When I first saw pictures of the Tora, I was mildly disappointed because it was very similar to other McLarens. But then again, they've only actually been producing cars, road cars, if you ignore the F1, for 10 years now. So the, the heritage of McLaren road cars is evolving. Think of it as 911. And what they like to do, there's this styling feature here with the headlights sort of recessed and this rad here. That's a sort of to echo their logo, this art look. So you'll see that on McLaren. And I, I've sort of just want to show you down here the radios are almost unprotected this one has no grill on it at all and it is the best place to collect leaves i know we're in november but i just fighting the number of leaves down there a little point on the headlights spectacular um, i've used this car at night fantastic headlights on this car this is interesting this is now metal this hood and the sort of crease in it so more previously it was um form body panels but they're using this super form aluminium panels this is actually plastic this um, wing here as is the nose treatment i love the standard ccm brakes on it and the mclaren orange calipers they're actually an extra i think machine logo mclaren orange and silver 1570 for those calipers keep on coming around one feature i really like are these dihedra doors you don't guess that on the Ferrari 296 or a Hurricane or anything like that. And it adds to the supercar theatre of this car. So we'll have a look at the interior in, when we're outside. But a very nice focused driver cockpit. It is maturing beautifully how they're doing the interiors. I got into this car at night, first drive, and I could tell where everything was. It also works very well for getting in and out. And then this deep, big scalloped door, this, which is metal, feeding the rads back here. And this is also the clamsh rear clamshell is in super formed aluminium as well. The wheels on this 19 and 20 inch and this lovely finish, this sort of smoke gray finish on the wheels, very elegant, super uh, lightweight forged aluminium wheel lights. Not sure about the styling at the rear. The positives, I quite like this flying buttress idea and the way that the glass curves around here and obviously the airflow comes around here. But I'm not sure about this rear window, this sudden sort of jarring to me cut off. And, you know, it's the only car I know that's sort of starred on the XJS rear window. I don't like it and it looks a bit cheap because you can see the um, heater elements in it. Surely I'd like to see a sort of spoiler there or something to blow air over the engine. And then the engine cover it's all sort of very industrial this isn't removable i can see a sort of chimney here that vents lots of hot air when you're driving it you see sort of plumes of hot air coming out of that but it's yeah nothing to look at no decoration no artistry and how the engine is presented and i'm disappointed you can't see anything you can see more rads through this grill here as well this has sports exhaust on it not sure that's a good idea, but we'll get to that when we come to drive it. And I'm surprised there's not more aero going on here. It seems very smooth at the back here. Yes, it's got the diffuser and tantalised on it. When you're following it, you can see the rear of the gearbox as you could on a Ferrari 288 or something like that. But I just think it's a bit weak uh, for this 200 mile an hour super McLaren hybrid 
um, sports car, supercar, call it what you will. One nice thing is when you pop the button in the cockpit, there's no other secondary catch that just opens. And a really quite a big space in there for going away. There's electric cable down there, obviously, because you can charge this car um, remotely if you all use the engine. One thing I haven't mentioned is the price of it. Price of this car starts £189,200. The extras on this car total £19,720. I'll go through those when we're in the car. So a total of £208,000 as you see it here. It's worth pointing out that the Ferrari 296 is significantly more expensive. List is uh, 241,560, so in, it's 52,000 pounds more expensive than Arturo. But once you start specking a 296, well, that one I had into test was 359,227, 151,000 pounds more expensive than this McLaren. Crazy. So what's it, what's it drive like in comparison to the 296? Well, let's take it outside and find out. the theater of that door getting in and out it's all part of the mclaren experience why is the fan making lots of noise yeah he's on its lowest setting and you're just installed in this driver focus cockpit and it's all very close i thought the dash was a bit close but actually when i adjust it it's um i'll just turn everything on yeah it, it goes it is electric and it comes out a little bit further, but the, it all comes out, the wheel and the dash together, tight. And as I said, I got in it in the dark first time and everything worked. And thank the Lord for a wheel that is for steering. No buttons, no nothing. The two rocker paddles, very clever that you can press either one to get that action. And the, uh, the extras on this car, well, performance interior. Includes Napo leather interior environment, dark grey, etc., and contrast reflective piping. It all lights up at night, it's pretty cool actually. £4,400, um, and then the carbon fibre interior pack, which is this carbon fibre around here and on the spokes I see and on the paddles themselves, £4,000 again. Sports exhaust, £4,700. Tire pressures and temperatures there. Starts off in electric, so we're ready to go. Do that and off we go and I love the way it starts off in electric once experience it's just the right way to start the journey it has a slightly peculiar thing though if I just move it up to comfort the engine will start up but it won't actually power the car and it goes through this sort of warming up um, system unlike other cars that put them the cold engine straight to work that does not happen on the McLaren Arturo. It says conditioning engine, so I'm still on electric and the engine is warming up. So anyway, what I'm gonna do now, head off to my favorite bits of road and you'll be joining me a little bit later. It's still all in auto. imagine with 670 odd horsepower and there is a distinctive note to this engine it's it's a harsher note than the more tuneful Ferrari but you don't feel shortchanged at all by going to V6 away from V8 which is a, a big surprise in both of the cars it was something I was fearful for they would feel you know it wouldn't quite sound as I want them to sound um, being the carbon tub etc there is a bit of sound coming through they're just notorious they just project sound into the cabin more than a conventionally built car but having measured it on my bit of road it's not that bad actually it was 76 77 um, decibels at 60 miles an hour which is a fair bit lower than the Porsche GT3s I've had in recently and sort of on par I think with that Ferrari and now I love also that McLaren have moved the controls for um, gearbox and handling onto these ones on just on the either side of the dash. So easy to use. So I'm going into Burford 
and I can just click it down and go into electric mode as I enter the sort of 20 zone as we come into Burford. Massive fan, got 14 mile range, and um, yeah, I will just tickle through Burford with no um, no sound, sitting in traffic, terrific, and big uh, success just where the controls are. I mean, I've got indicator stalks, no wipers here, and it all makes sense. Also, the navigation and setting all that up, piece of cake. Works every time. I like also if I just press it, it comes up with the actual um, speed. So actually via satellites rather than speed over there. And dead easy to program. I can remember McLaren being determined to have a portrait style um, tablet to control their cars through and went through hell in the beginning of the 12C to get it to work because no one else was doing it, everybody was going landscape. Great view out as well, visibility, sort of really um, deep window, gives a sort of toe-eye view of the road ahead. You, you, you don't feel intimidated, it just feels bang on. So move it out of electric, just flick on that. Comfort is the first one that comes up. Next one, Sport. I think for the squirt up the hill I actually ought to go all the way to track and the thing about track the other thing it does is recharge the battery it, it um, increases the amount that the engine the electric motor when you come off the throttle or part throttle charges up the battery so it's always got a full battery to fill in that torque so here we are I'm in it's in third right this is in auto here we go the foot flat down second to spin it up at the rear just in that you know, set up. It's a nonsense, this claim that this car is oh, it's a bit shame, it's got the horsepower of the Ferrari 296. It is monumentally quick. We've got into a crazy zone at the moment. I was looking at, at, at speeds and you, you look at the, um, the Ferrari Enzo. That wasn't a slow car. To 200 kilometers an hour, it was 10.3 seconds. This car, is timed at 8.3 seconds to 200 kilometers an hour that's 124 miles an hour and the Inventador SVJ is 8.2 it is crazy the speed of today's uh, modern supercars and you know sports cars like this this is um, as I say the Ferrari is a second quicker to 200 at 7.3 instead of 8.3 but there being no doubt this is a properly quick car. One thing I've noticed with this car, the only thing about this sports exhaust, is a, there's a drone that sort of sets up annoyingly if you've got it in comfort or sport and you're going on the motorway and you're only doing the 60, 65 miles an hour. There's an uncomfortable drone with this car. But at motorway speed, 70, 75 indicated, no problem at all. Anyway, let's see what it's like down here. Sport at the moment, and I've got it in manual. I think I'll use second. Turn it. Just. It just feels so natural around there. It. I mean, it just feels as though this is the sort of road it was made for, and I love it to bits for that. it wasn't so high geared you might have noticed I can't really rev it out in the gears because it is so long geared why do manufacturers do this I've got eight gears to choose from and second takes me all the way to 80 miles an hour but eight and a half thousand revs so when it when it cuts out and you just think why please bring me lower down so I can enjoy that peak that crescendo in the gear but legally in the UK I can only enjoy it in first to second not second to third here's this bumpy bit of road almost forgot to mention it because it just glides down here there is a bit of movement you can see the steer wheel is busy no foreign of camber off into the hedge it's it's terrific it is mind-blowingly good it, it is so far ahead of what that Ferrari felt like just the honesty and the information I get from the steering 
GT3 was was good in that respect, but just too um, like just because of that, the way it followed cameras. This not so. Feels fantastic down here, and the ride. It is. I mean, some McLarens are just defy physics with the link suspension. This hasn't got the link suspension on it. It's got regular suspension on it. Um, but down here, it, it feels sporting, but in no way uncomfortable. And the seats just grip you right, and I've got great visibility. As you can probably tell, I'm quite enjoying this. Here's the first bit of test. See how it copes with this sudden compression as I go over this bump in the dip. Beautifully handled. Absolutely beautifully handled. Textbook. I'm in force, I've got that torque in fill, and I can I don't have to use the revs, I can just use the torque. Oh it's just likes with this car. I think it is. I suppose my first dislike is just that resonance. Having used this car, I've been up and down to the NEC um, a couple of times in it. It was tedious at times and I ended up actually taking it out of auto and putting it into manual so I could take it out of 8th gear and cruise along in 6th gear instead. I do wonder if it's the sports exhaust causing all the issues because I watched um, Chris Harris did a video on it and it didn't seem to have that resonance at all so maybe his car didn't have the sports exhaust. I would strongly suggest saving £4,000 and not ticking that box. Another thing, it's sometimes the gearbox and electric motor don't sort of combine quite as smooth as they should. It sort of, it, it, it engage, the engine doesn't engage very smoothly sometimes. It's a stumble. It's not a reason not to buy the car, but it's not as finessed as some other cars out there. Then, not a slight dislike, the, the styling isn't as sort of emotive as perhaps other cars out there. And I'm thinking specifically of 296. It's a bit purposeful, should we say, and I don't really like the way they haven't dressed the engine up and that sort of thing. But it makes up for it with the doors, etc. And I think it's colour sensitive as well, and it is does appear to be much better built with tighter shut lines than went before. Simplicity of the cabin. They've they've enhanced it. They've moved on a generation, and it is dead simple to use. Everything makes sense. They've really worked on ergonomics, and it's terrific. None of the silliness that you get with a Ferrari, etc. So I really like that. And that is my testing Benz. Let's just try around here. Let's try second round here. I'm in sport. There, the perfect brake feel. And out of here, bang, power out. God, it's quite punchy. Oh, oh, thank goodness we're on the lights. Another light. Everything that that car just did through those corners. Perfect driving position, focus, steering, honesty. I've got all that information coming through. I know exactly what the car's going to do. I feel engaged with it absolutely at one with it because the controls are so good it's what McLaren do well and some people are arguing that some other McLarens are even better well I uh, this I'm driven a McLaren recently I'm loving loving this I can't it's beyond criticism really after the cars I've just had the GT3 and the 296 and when you consider the quality of them that I can't give it higher praise for that I also like the size of this car it's, it's fairly compact, and that's good when you're placing it on a road like this. I mean, it's wider than you would want, but it is pretty compact in this world. And yet I've got all this space inside, dead easy to live with. Conclusion, what I see about the Atoro, I 
mean, it absolutely takes on Ferrari 296. Don't listen to anybody who says it's not a rival. It's a deadly rival. It's also remarkably cheaper. £150,000 cheaper in the, te- the two forms I've tested them in. £50,000 cheaper at showroom as list. That is a massive difference for basically a very, very similar car. I suppose it falls down slightly, doesn't quite have the emotional pull of the 296 because of perhaps the styling and the sound of the engine. But everywhere else, it fights its corner and it, for absolute driving pleasure and feel engaged with it, I think it's got the edge over the 296 because of this beautiful steering. The other thing to consider is it's British made. Um, most of the components that are made in the UK, engine is um, done by Ricardo, etc. And it's available. If you want a Ferrari 296, you have to be good mates with your Ferrari dealership. You have to go through the hoops, perhaps order a Portofino or a Roma or, I don't know, an FF. I'm oh, sorry, a Lusso or something. And then you might get an allocation of 296 and then you have a long wait. If you want a McLaren Natura, you go into a dealership and say, can I have one please and can you spec and they'll talk you to very nicely and you'll go through the journey and you will be able to buy one without any silly hoops to go through. I find that idea quite attractive. I also like this pretty good um, package that comes as standard. It's three years servicing, five year warranty I think it is, and that's extendable out to 15 years old. And then you get to drive one of the best handling cars made for British B roads. It's a pretty good deal to me. So there you go. As you can probably tell, I've enjoyed my time with the McLaren Tour. It's been a long time coming, but now I'm behind the wheel. It's just great. So have enjoyed this video. Well, keep watching, keep subscribing. Because there'll be some more videos coming on very soon. Thanks for watching.